Not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. We don't actually know who said that, by the way, but Einstein used to have it up on his office wall, and he kept it there to remind himself and other scientists and other mathematicians that the really important stuff in life, that the stuff that really matters, the stuff that we've been hearing about tonight, isn't necessarily the stuff that fits neatly into a graph. Which I have to say I find a little bit gutting, because I'm actually fond of a graph, I like a bit of data, my day job is to, to look through numbers, and I have the somewhat unenviable task tonight of following our talks about simplicity uh, and about courage and about heart by talking to you about statistics. And that is what I am going to do regardless. I'm going to show you a graph or two. I'm going to talk to you about research uh, because I think that happiness is actually a bit of an economic story. I'm going to claim this one for my team, for my side of the street. And I'm not alone in that. The UN actually agrees with me although there's a chance that they see that relationship as working a little bit the other way around, they've been telling countries that they need to start finding a new way to measure success. Um, but basically, countries need to look beyond GDP, a new way of looking at progress. What they're saying is that it's not just about the big, tall, record-breaking towers that we put up and how much they cost to build and how much they generate, but it's about how happy the people who are living and working in those big, tall, record-breaking towers really are. That's you and, and me and the guy who valets your car and the woman who looks after your kids. They're saying that countries need to start looking at measuring whether or not we're all getting happier, not just if we're all getting richer. Now, it's not a new, new idea. Uh, Bhutan, for example, has been doing this since the 1970s, and you've probably heard about it. But the reason you've probably heard about it is because journalists like me like to make a fuss out of it, and the reason we like to make a fuss out of it is because not many other people are doing it. One or two have chimed in, Thailand's been doing it, the UK, a few others are thinking about thinking about doing it, but pretty much as an idea, it's not moving very fast. But I don't think that it should be discounted, and in fact, I think here in the UAE, it's an idea that we should be thinking about quite a lot, because. I think that's the way that we're moving at the moment. There's been a lot of talk in government circles about happiness recently. His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the ruler of Dubai, stood up two, three weeks ago at a government summit, and he said that the whole point of government in this country was to make you happy. We've also got a big happiness conference that's in the works at the moment, and one of the big speakers who's coming out for that is a guy called John Halliwell, and he is pretty much the foremost happiness researcher working in the country at the moment. So I look at all of that, and I think that it might be a natural next step for the UAE. I think that might be the way that we are going. And if it is, well, what do we have to do then? Because if we're going to measure happiness, we need to make sure that we get it right. Because there's a lot of critics out there, there's a lot of people who think that governments shouldn't be bothering with this. Some of them think that it's too costly, some of them think that it's a waste of resources, some of them think that it's patronizing. There's a worry that it might be used to fulfill a political agenda, that basically the results could be used to promote an ideology. And actually, North Korea has a happiness index, although not many people actually take it that seriously, it must be said. And everybody who's winning in the North Korean happiness competition is pretty much mates of North Korea. It's China and it's Venezuela. Venezuela and it's Iran and it's Cuba and it's North Korea itself. And the losers down the other end, well, they're pretty much the people who disagree with North Korea. It's uh, America and it's, uh, it's South Korea. But that bias aside, the real reason, the big reason that the critics don't like the idea of measuring happiness is because they say quite simply that it can't be done. They say that happiness can't be quantified. But there is actually a lot of happiness numbers out there. There are a lot of institutions doing it. Not many countries, but there are a lot of big organizations that have been measuring your happiness, actually, for years. Uh, the happiness of countries, and then they rank them against each other. So I thought that if you were going to start looking at happiness, if you were a country doing this from scratch, this is pretty much where you'd start. And the easiest thing to do would be to look at what country in the world was the happiest. Because then you could pretty much cheat, actually, because you could just you know, copy what they were doing and, and, and do it that way, rather than bothering with all the measurement stuff. So I went through about six or seven of these reports, 
and I found out that the happiest country in the world is actually Australia. And it's Panama, and it's Paraguay, and it's Denmark, and it's Costa Rica, and it's Norway, and it's Colombia, and it's Indonesia. How is that? Well, we've got one index which claims that the Latin American countries are clearly the happiest, and we've got another two that say it's the Scandinavians. Ipsos and uh, the UN Happiness Report, they say that countries are getting slightly happier year on year. And then you've got the Happy Planet Index, which says that actually no country is truly sustainably happy. Uh, you've got Costa Rica coming top of one pole and 37th of another. You've got Sweden coming third in one pole and 52nd in another. The Philippines comes eighth in one pole, 67th in another. And as for the UAE, well, we rank 17th. And we rank 29th. And we rank 130th. And it doesn't mean that it's bad data, by the way. It's not. Good reports from some really good organizations. But they're all measuring different stuff. So if you as a country, maybe the UAE, maybe someone else, was going to start with measuring happiness, you need to make a decision about what exactly you're going to be counting. And one of the easy places to start, one thing that people like, is counting the objective stuff, the tangible stuff, the stuff that you can look at. It's a bit easier. Stuff like how long do people live for and uh, how many swimming pools have you all got. And that works, except we've got one problem. How do you decide what factors in life are going to make people happy? Actually, we've got two problems. Who is it who gets to decide what makes people happy? I mean, are you just going to go out there and tell people what should be making them happy? And the third problem, actually, is how do you start weighing these things up? How do you balance them? If you've got air quality and maternity leave, how do you decide what's worth what? And then how do you start comparing the different countries with each other? Uh, if you've got a country that's got, I don't know, high unemployment and they've got a recession on, but people are able to go out in the streets and protest against their lack of jobs, are you likely to be happier there than in a country with high GDP and, and lots of jobs, but no political freedom? Fortunately, there is an easier, softer way to do all of this. And that is that you can pretty much just ask people how they're feeling. You can measure what we call self-reported happiness or uh, effective happiness. Pretty much going out with a clipboard and saying, how happy are you, scale of 1 to 10, da 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 da. And that is a very effective way, except for when it's not. For example, if someone asks you how happy you are, you might have a different happiness set point. Your happyometer might be different than somebody else. What you might call a six for mood and how you're doing, someone else might be ranking mentally as a nine. Or you might have different expectations of what it's going to take in life to make you happy. There was a really great happiness poll, or rather, there was a really great unhappiness poll that one of the local newspapers did on Facebook recently, and they asked people to tell them what was making them unhappy about their lives here in Dubai. And a bloke called Gavin wrote in, and he said that his biggest problem currently was speed bumps on the palm, and that as a result, he thought he might have to sell his Porsche. <laughs> that is what we call a high-class problem. And I'm pretty sure that if you were to do a bit of happiness research, say in the labor camps or on the outskirts of Dubai, you're not going to get Porsche problems cropping up very often. But you are probably going to get events, and that's the other problem with measuring subjective or effective happiness. What's going on in someone's life is going to affect that. You phone up, how are you doing? I'm doing a happiness poll. Someone says, I'm not doing that great, my fish just died. Doesn't mean they're not a happy person, just means that you've got hold of them on the wrong Tuesday. And all of this, by the way, is before we even start trying to figure out what the numbers you might possibly connect, what they might actually mean. The UK has been doing its polls doing a well-being survey for the last year or so, asking people how they're feeling. Being British, I imagine that makes them very uncomfortable. And what they have found demographically is this. The happiest person in Britain is likely to be a married woman of Indian descent with kids on a Scottish island, a remote Scottish island, by the way, employed and working as a florist and a gardener. I mean, I have no idea what you're even supposed to do with that. Does it tell us that married people are happier than single people? Or does it tell us that happy people are more likely to get married? Does it tell us that unemployment makes you unhappy? Or should we start thinking about whether or not unhappiness gets in the way of people being able to find a job? And I don't even know about the florist and gardener, but is it working outside? Is it working with plants? Is it being creative? Is it working with people? This kind of stuff can go on and on. 
But given all of that, given all of the problems and the what ifs and the how could you's and the why would you's, should governments bother to invest time and money and possibly be criticised for measuring happiness? Yeah, do you know what? Actually, I think they absolutely should. Because data doesn't have to be perfect to be useful. Your teachers are not going to tell you this, but a lot of the data that we rely on at the moment is actually full of holes. Unemployment, loads of flaws. Early GDP is pretty much just a guess. And we're already asking people for, for feelings and opinions every time we carry out a customer confidence survey or, or every time we do a, a business sentiment survey. You're pretty much asking people how they feel about the economy. And yet we use that data. And we use it because it gives us a, a baseline and it allows us to see trends and we can see if we're getting better or worse and we can see how it correlates to other data. We can see if our spending that we're putting in different areas is, is paying off. And then hopefully it all starts feeding back into public policy. Because if we have happiness numbers, and, and they count and people take them seriously, there's a good chance that politicians might be more inclined to make people orientated decisions if they're worried about how the, the happy numbers are going to be playing out. Now this is especially important for wealthy countries like the UAE. Because the wealthier you are as a country, the harder it actually is to make your people happier. I've got time to squeeze in one graph, and this one was actually put together for me by my friend Dr. Kai at the Emirates Competitiveness Council, and they're putting together the Big Happiness Conference. And we've got GDP per person on the bottom, and the uh, Gallup World Poll happiness numbers going up the side there. And you can see the steep curve is where the poorer countries get happier a lot faster with just a little rise in, in GDP. There's a, there's a big jump up the wealthier you get. That's Ukraine, the yellow dot. We've got the UAE as the green dot, and Qatar is pretty much almost out the hall. And you can see that the more GDP that we're acquiring there, it's only a little, little rise, almost no rise in happiness. I mean, as an example, if you give 200 bucks to someone in the Ukraine, they're thinking, awesome, you know, we can pay off some debt, this will help the kids go through school. You give $200 to someone in Qatar, you've basically just bought them lunch. <laughs> and the happiness data can help with this because as a wealthier country, and you're subject here to the, the law of diminishing returns, it you know, helps a little bit, but not a lot to get wealthier, you can raise the happiness by raising things that aren't economic. Finding out what makes your people happy, whether it's a, an easier, shorter, or a safer commute, or a better work-life balance, and investing in that instead. But funny enough, with the money, we've actually got some evidence at the moment that whilst money causes happiness to a point, happiness might also help us to make more money. There's a, a fund management company in the US called Panesis that we're all keeping a big eye on at the moment because they only invest in the kind of companies that have happy workers, the kind of companies that we see in the, the top 100 happiest places to work indices. And they're consistently outperforming the S&P index, particularly in the last five years over the downturn, almost double the, the average uh, S&P returns. We've also got some new figures that have just come out of the US just in the last month that show that people who are happy as teenagers go on to make 10% more than the norm as adults. And those who say that they were unhappy as teenagers make 30% less than the norm. And that's your retirement cruise money that we're talking about. You might want to think about that the next time you yell at your kids. So all of this stuff that supposedly can't be counted could start to feed back in to all the stuff that we think can be counted after all. Which is all very nice, but I wouldn't blame you for wondering what it all has to do with you. Um, but the thing is, it actually does because we can sit around waiting for all our different governments to start maybe moving on this or having think tanks or talking to consultants or taking a vote or whatever it happens to be, depending on how your own political process works. Or we could just start doing it ourselves, which I think might actually be the key. Bringing in happiness measurements to our schools, bringing in happiness measurements to our offices, and bringing in happiness measurements to our universities. Showing that on the ground, it actually counts with us. Not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. But by starting to count happiness ourselves, by starting to bring in those measures, we are saying that we think that they count with us, that that's where our priorities lie. And that, 
accounts for a lot as well.